Today marks three weeks since uh, Jay Slater vanished on June the 17th. We've seen 12 days of searches by the Spanish Garda Seville. They ended their search last weekend, much to the despair of the family who are out here on the island. Since then, the family have led a number of searches in the hope of trying to find some kind of clue, some kind of breakthrough. But it's very difficult because there's just only a small number of them. And essentially, they're retracing the same steps that have already been taken by the Spanish Garda Seville. So in terms of the search for Jay, we are no further forward than where we were three weeks ago. In terms of the investigation, however, we have made some substantial steps forward in terms of trying to piece together the last few hours before Jay vanished into thin air. It's a very odd set of circumstances. So Jay, 19 year old, on his first holiday with the lads was down in Los Cristianos, which is a bustling area in Tenerife, full of uh, nightclubs and various bars. What seems to have happened is that he was at an NRG music festival. He meets two men, one of them, Ayub Kasim, who is a convicted drug dealer. And for some reason, he goes with Ayub Kasim and this other mystery man for now, out 30 minutes away from Los Cristianos, up a very, very steep winding road into the mountains to a place called Masca. And there they, they stayed overnight in a 40 pound B and Airbnb, which had been booked by Ayub Kasim. And that's one of the key questions. And there are many, many questions with many, many questions remaining unanswered. Why on earth did he leave Los Cristianos and drive up into the mountains with Ayab Kasim? What went on inside that Airbnb? And why on earth did he leave the next morning by foot instead of catching the bus? And by foot, he will have walked out of that Airbnb, turned on his Google Maps or his Apple Maps, and it would have told him that to get back to where he needed to be would have taken 11 hours. It remains uh, unclear at the moment uh, as to why he didn't catch a bus, why he didn't head back down the mountain towards Masca, why he didn't wait for a lift. The suggestion being at the moment from private investigator Mark Williams Thomas is that he was scared of something or someone. And that's pretty much at the heart of this. We just don't know. There's no explanation. We've got uh, various statements that have been issued by Ayub Kasim as to what happened, what unfolded. He says that Jay arrived at the Airbnb alive and that he left the Airbnb alive. We've got also statements from Lucy May Law, the last person to speak to him during a panicked phone call where he said that he was in the middle of nowhere. He was lost. He had no water and he had 1% left on his battery. So for now, as I say, that there are more questions than there are answers. And that is probably at the very heart of it. What, what on earth happened at that Airbnb? That's crucial. The family are frustrated. So initially, they've, they've essentially gone from feeling extremely sad to now anger. The Spanish police don't work in the same way that British police do. There isn't a family liaison officer working with the family and feeding information to the family so that they're feeling connected to the investigation. They are very much detached from it. So they have no idea what lines or leads the Spanish police are following up. Uh, and that is turning to, to, to turning them towards, towards anger and despair. You know, we're three weeks on now. Uh, and I spoke to Glenn Duncan, who is Jay's nephew over the weekend. He was part of one of the searches. And he said that he was utterly baffled why Spanish police allowed Ayub Kasim and another man to leave the country, to leave Tenerife, without, um, without any follow-up. And, and then they classed them very early on as irrelevant to the case. And they can't seem to understand why that was allowed to happen so early on, given that Ayub Kasim and this other man were the last people to see Jay before he vanished on June the 17th. Um, so they're, they're very frustrated. They're, they're very much in the dark and they know as much as we do, which um, which for them is adding to their to their, their their desperation. The authorities will simply say that they spent 12 exhaustive days looking around this mountainous region up towards Masca. They searched high and low. They sent helicopters up. They sent drones up. They had a, a, a large number of individuals searching through that area for Jay and found no sign of him whatsoever, no trace. It, it's, it's entirely possible that in the days they might resume 
searches, but they don't feel that there are any definitive leads in which to take them back up there. And the family understand that, they respect that. It's not necessarily anything to do with money or resources. It's just simply that they feel as though they have done a, a full and proper search of that area. And to put it into perspective, it is such a vast area that unless you have any specific leads, you're pretty much searching for a needle in a haystack. And I think that's very much the view of it at the moment. So they've they've stalled their search for Jay, but they say that their investigation into his disappearance continues. And if that throws up any leads as to where he might be, then I suspect that search will resume. Throughout the Guardia Seville search for Jay, we haven't heard any mention of searching the sea with no vessels being deployed for that. And now that Jay's dad, Warren, raises this as a possibility, and let's remember, Warren has been out there for some considerable time. He has walked the routes time and time again. He's thoroughly familiarised himself with the territory. I think this is a possibility that maybe should have been explored earlier on during the search. But of course, the ocean is often very slow to give up its secrets, and sometimes it simply never does. So if this is a possibility, and if this has happened, then once again, my concerns for Jay's safety are grave, and my thoughts remain with the family who must be going through absolute torture. Taking an overview from afar, which is what I've been doing, it seems clear to me that the Guardia Seville have, have left some huge gaps in their investigation. A particular concern was detectives returning to the Airbnb over two weeks after Jay's disappearance. It seems to me that any suggestion of foul play has largely and perhaps conveniently been ignored by the Guardia Seville, who essentially want to keep Tenerife running as a tourist destination. They don't want to think, they don't want the public to be thinking that young Brits can go there on holiday and perhaps have something dreadful happen to them. So it seems to me this has been an investigation of convenience, and now their theory has proven to be not proven. Um, I think they have quietly let it go away, and they're probably hoping that this story will drop off the front pages, that people will lose interest and life will return to normal. The Slater family are not going to allow that to happen. And I give them all due credit for finding the strength to carry on, for keeping this story very much front and centre of the news agenda wherever they can, and they have my utmost respect for that.